My name is Graham McIndoe. I'm speaking to you guys from Brooklyn, New York, in my living room, and you might hear a few cars going by because I'm pretty close to the expressway. I grew up in Scotland between Edinburgh and Glasgow, and you know, I spent a lot of my youth uh, being into music and specifically punk music in the late 70s and through the 80s. And I went to art school in Edinburgh where I actually studied painting and then went to London. I went to the Royal College, which was quite a jump for me because I hadn't studied photography at all. I'd studied painting, but I'd always taken photographs and somehow I managed to get into the Royal College, which was still pretty amazing to me that I got in there because it was very prestigious at the time. And then after two years at the Royal College where I met my then girlfriend and had my son Liam there, I moved to New York to follow a career in photography. When I first moved to New York, I wasn't sure what I was going to do in photography. I knew I wanted to work within the field of photography. I'd fallen in love with it and was pretty passionate about it. But uh, the first five years I spent working in galleries. But because I was always taking pictures, I eventually moved on into working commercially as a photographer. Before I knew it, I was photographing for a lot of magazines, working on commercial ad campaigns, getting flown all over the world to do annual reports. And I was photographing Gary Oldman. I photographed Michael Jackson. I got sent on film sets. I was photographing, you know, for Nike and ESPN. So the trajectory at that point was really, really quick for me. It wasn't something I'd really envisaged for myself, was working at that level as a commercial photographer people who do stuff for you and so it was very foreign to me and I was always really surprised when people threw money at you and then gave you money to buy your breakfast and your lunch and a cup of coffee and someone to help you and a taxi and all that sort of stuff. And that world was really surprising to me, very, very surprising to me. Even I thought that I was, it was too much money sometimes and that I was getting paid it. But of course, not all photography is really well paid. You know, I mean, photojournalism and editorial, I think, is you can make a living. It's a good living, but you're you're not getting paid what you're getting paid for shooting advertising campaigns. And that's where the real money comes in. It was interesting to be, you know, in a position where people would call you up and say, hey, you're available next week. We'd like to send you to LA to photograph Randy Newman. We're doing an article on him. But I've often found that it's a... People that you get sent that they have an interesting story about them that are not on that sort of celebrity bandwidth that are more inclined to give you more time and more inclined to reveal things about the cell. Even if you don't agree with it, I've photographed some people that politically I might not agree with or, you know, some of their stances, I'm just like, wow. But they always have something interesting about them that reveals something to me about how other people live their life. Those jobs are more fulfilling for me. You know, I enjoyed that sort of, you know, meeting these people that are not in the public eye or they might be doing something that's slightly interesting and something's picked up on it and so some magazine's doing a feature on it. I started working as a photographer because I was someone who was always taking pictures. I took portraits of friends, I photographed landscapes, I did... I photographed everything that was going on around me, you know, because I really loved photography. I still take pictures now. I've always taken pictures. I mean, I just... Sometimes I think it's almost like an affliction. I encourage all my students to keep sketchbooks and notebooks, you know. I don't like them to be taking out and writing notes on their phones. I like them to be carrying sketchbooks, you know. I tell them and I send them on their first day in class at the beginning of the semester, go to this store, it's just around the corner, spend five bucks, buy a sketchbook and just write your ideas in there and scribble ideas. And if you find a piece of paper or a picture in the street or a Polaroid or whatever it is, stick it in there. When you look back through it, it'll be much more meaningful than a, a note on your iPhone that you can delete accidentally and doesn't have any real aesthetic value. I still do it, but I, I try to get my students to do it a lot, you know. So I've had several years of working as a really successful commercial photographer, working editorially, working for advertising agencies, flying around the world, being lucky enough to meet celebrities and, you know, it's sort of the dream world of, of a photographer, to be perfectly honest with you. But uh, during that period, I'd started drinking too much, I'd started dabbling with drugs and... 
it just took me off at a tangent that I never ever really expected in my life. You know, I slowly but surely and very insidiously the drugs kicked in and I became a very, very bad heroin and crack cocaine addict. I first met Graham McIndoo in 2002 when we were both part of the same summer house out in Montauk at the end of Long Island near New York. At the time, he was working as a commercial photographer. There were a lot of us who kind of came and went to that house over the course of the summer, and I really just knew him as someone who partied a bit and uh, drank, I would say, more than the average person at the time. He had a girlfriend, and we sort of lost touch over that after that summer. Then I reached out to him in 2005 when I needed an author photo taken for a travel book I'd written and went over to get my picture taken. At that point, Graham wasn't in that relationship anymore. I wasn't in a relationship. And by the end of that very long photo shoot in that afternoon, the next day he asked me out on a date. I was living on the Upper West Side. He was living in Brooklyn, in New York. We joked that that's sort of a long-distance relationship. You know, we really only saw each other on weekends, so it took a while for me to realize that there was something a little bit off about him. We tend to see and experience addiction as viewers at the extreme end of the spectrum. You know, we don't really have a popular conception of the functional addict. So for me, the idea that Graham could be functional as a photographer and a guy that I would be interested in dating, it, at first people just would ask, well, how could you not have known? It wasn't obvious to me. And, you know, we have pictures from a trip we took to Hawaii. And my mom, when she saw those photos, she said, oh, he looks so wholesome. Unbeknownst to me or really anyone else, he was using heroin at the time. I was still working for many years during that time, so I thought, I'm still working, I'm making money, I'm not that bad, you know, this is just a period I'm going through. But, you know, as you get more and more into drugs, your awareness of where you are and what's going on with you fitters away. And by the time I sort of realised and tried to do anything about it, I was really deep in. I eventually found out that Graham was using drugs when um, I found him sitting on the couch in his house with a crack pipe. For a variety of reasons, I didn't end up breaking up with him right then. So I sort of stuck around for a while, um, you know, and then it, until it became apparent that he really just wasn't getting the help and I thought me being continuing a relationship was actually hurting things more than it was helping. And I think I had this feeling that, you know, we all have that sort of tough love. If I just walk away, you know, that's going to motivate him to quit. I've always taken pictures, and even in the, the depths of my addiction, where I didn't work commercially for years, and I was, my whole life was unraveling, and I'd isolated myself from everyone that I knew, and I was on a very, very slippery, dark downhill path, I was still taking pictures. But it wasn't only the pictures that I was taking that were sort of from that period. I collected all the being a compulsive collector of things in my whole life. And so sort of, I was intrigued by the design of the heroin baggies that I was buying around New York City. I didn't see it as collecting at the time. I just kept them because I was intrigued by them. I loved the designs. I loved the quirky little pictures with guns and cartoon characters and, you know, statements on them that were just totally over the top sometimes. So I'd be sticking them in books or little boxes and stuff like that. And also just other things that were going on around me. You know, I was writing in scrapbooks. You know, I was keeping letters. I was keeping... I got arrested a number of time. I kept the arrest warrants. I kept... All that sort of stuff, court appearances, rehab papers, stuck them in boxes. I was surprised when I came through all that sort of stuff and got myself clean and a couple of different friends of mine had stuck stuff in storage or kept things in their houses for me and I started pulling that stuff together. I started finding all this stuff again. I started finding the heroin baggies and the notebooks and the Polaroids and the undeveloped rolls of 35mm film and 120 film. And, and then I started finding all these 
cards, hundreds and hundreds of pictures that I'd taken during those years, over maybe six or seven years, and not really not knowing I was doing it, and sometimes looking at them, sometimes not looking at them, and sometimes losing the cards, and sometimes having the cameras stolen by other junkies. I didn't feel I had the right to show the pictures of the other people that I'd photographed, because they... they Consent while you're an addict is a very, very difficult thing. You'll say and do a lot of things in an addict and say everything's okay. That in the reality of day when you're clean, you'd just go, my God, I would never do or say that. So I decided to make it all about me. Another point in the Code of Ethics is give special consideration to vulnerable subjects. And that's something that Graham has addressed in explaining why he decided not to photograph other addicts, um, is this issue of consent. You know, we recognize now that someone who is addicted to drugs and has a serious problem, you know, they have difficulties with decision making and making rational choices. So to say that this person can consent to having their picture taken and then published, I think is a bit problematic because, you know, we recognize that, you know, they aren't really making decisions that are informed by um, rational choices. And I think that is something that we really need to think about because that person might get clean and then later regret that their image is out in the world, you know, showing them at their worst moment and they can't take it back. I had started taking photographs of the people around me in their environment and sometimes I'd ended up in the pictures and then it just felt more pertinent for me to photograph myself because I was living that life and I shouldn't really be pointing the camera at other people. I felt I should be pointing it at myself. So fast forward a few years, and I had lost touch with him at that point. He had really gone downhill. Um, we would kept in touch occasionally via email, um, but then he sort of just disappeared off the radar. And I started reaching out to a couple other people who had known him, just sort of under the assumption that maybe he'd overdosed because his phone had been turned off. The website you know, he used to promote his photography was offline. I mean, I spent close to a decade of my life juggling too much drinking, dabbling with drugs, turning into a serious addiction, and everything that I went along with that. And I kept telling myself that I could get clean on my own. I kept thinking that it was something that I could do just through willpower and strength. And it's just like, I just need to buckle down and do it. But, you know, I was totally incapable of that. Strangely enough, the most devastating thing for me at that time was finally being arrested and sentenced to six months in Rikers Island, which is a prison on an island on the outskirts of New York City, and I think it's one of the biggest penal colonies in the world, which totally blew me away because it was somewhere I never, ever thought I would end up in. So I cold turkeyed in a cell in Rikers Island, which was a really, really painful thing, you know, the physicality of it. And then once you get that out of your system a little bit, the readjusting of your body to being clean and then psychologically the, you know, realization of where the last several years of your life have been are really crushing, you know. I mean, it was a really, really tough time for me. But it also gave me that moment of clarity, as they call it, where I sort of could look back and say, wow, I just put myself through this and my friends through this and my family through this. And thinking of the collateral damage to my mom and my dad and my friends and my son and everyone was really big. By the time I tracked him down, he was actually due to be released from Rikers. And rather than getting uh, released, he ended up in Homeland Security custody and was very quickly moved to detention centers in first in downtown Manhattan and then in New Jersey and then Pennsylvania. So I managed to get someone at the prison where he was being held in Pennsylvania to give him my phone number, and that's when we reconnected. I was in a county jail in Pennsylvania that had an immigration wing, and I found out they had a 24-7 cognitive behavioral therapy program in there for four months and that's that's how I got clean essentially was in a prison rehabilitation program and it set the groundwork for me to when I got out to build on that and I've been clean ever since which is seven and a half years or something like that. We talked on the phone we exchanged these really intense letters and you know by the time his final hearing was coming up um it was his lawyer who actually asked if i would be okay with graham coming to stay with me for a while if he got released so all of a sudden he was on a bus getting out at um 
the Port Authority Terminal near Times Square in New York, and that was the first time we saw each other when we were not separated by plexiglass. That was the first time I'd seen him in almost two years. So um, he came to stay with me, and he's still here. I could never get rid of him. <laughs> we actually just got married in uh, May of 2017. But when he was released, um, maybe not nine months clean, but also having spent nine months incarcerated. So he wasn't Graham the photographer. I think he didn't know who he was. And it, that was the process of rebuilding, you know, not just from that time away from everything, but also almost a decade of addiction. So it was a long process. I mean, he at first he didn't have any interest in picking up a camera. He would go to a grocery store and just stand in the aisles, kind of mystified by the amount of choice that you had, because all that's taken away when you're incarcerated. You know, he didn't have any interest in having a phone. He didn't have any interest in a computer. You know, it took a long time for Graham to, you know, feel pleasure again from the things that I feel pleasure from, you know, whether it's a great meal or sex or running or photography, you know, and that's because your brain changes from addiction, you know, particularly with dopamines. And, you know, I don't think people get prepared for how long that's going to take. So now that I'm been clean for a bit and I've started pulling together my life and I've rediscovered all this uh, ephemera and stuff, the photographs, the baggies, the notebooks, the Polaroids, all that sort of stuff from the years of addiction. I had spent a lot of time looking through them and it, it was somewhat upsetting for me and I started looking at these because even though I was clean now and I was happy I was clean and I wasn't a... 100% comfortable talking to people about what I'd been through because I was still in that place that uh, as an addict, you're shame-based because it's not like something that you boast about as being a heroin addict or a crack addict. It's something that you're pretty ashamed of, you know? So it's, it's a difficult thing to reveal to people. And some people, a lot of people knew about it, but a lot, some people didn't. And I would bump into people who would say, oh, where have you been the last few years? I haven't heard from you for ages. What, what's been going on? And the last thing you want to say is, oh, hey, it's good to see you. I've been a heroin addict and I was locked up in prison. The first time I saw them, I mean, it was just gut-wrenching. I mean, it was, it was so devastating, but also at the same time compelling because it showed me what Graham had been up to in these rooms and stairwells and places that I'd never seen. And I actually wrote about it in a journal at the time where I kind of described that attraction and this voyeurism to wanting to know about this part of his life he'd kept hidden, but then also how sad it was because what Graham chose to show was so much loneliness. And in all the photos, you know, by and large, he's by himself and just what his life had been reduced to. It took a lot of time looking at them because some of the pictures were really, really, really disturbing. And some of the really disturbing ones I haven't put out there because it's too rough on my family and my wife and myself even for people to see certain images they're just too tough you know they they show me in a light that I just don't want to share when he did start showing them to people there were really a range of reactions um one friend of ours just you know ran crying from the room when she first saw them it was hard looking at it and it was hard working out who the audience would be why would I want to show it who would this resonate with and what would be their takeaway it was like, I took these pictures of myself and this is what I went through and I want you to understand that people end up in this situation and what they go through and that they can recover as well. It was really important to me that, the, you know, the takeaway for this is that you can go through this stuff and you can recover. And I think that's missing for a lot of addiction photo essays and stuff like that is people are perfectly happy to photograph the addicts, the junkies and the torn down buildings or the desolate, isolated places. And they always, a lot of the time, seem victims and they always never seem to recover and there never seems to be an end story to it apart from, look, look at these addicts. So I wanted to show, look at this addict coming from me as the recovered addict. When Graham first started talking about or proposing that he might show these images to some photo editors or think about publishing them or exhibiting them, um, my first reaction was that that was a really scary thought, you know, not negative that he shouldn't do it, but just 
concern about how these images would be interpreted. So one of the things that I suggested is that if he was going to publish these images, that he include text accompanying the images, that he tell his story so that he could, to some degree, shape how people reacted to them. My response from magazines was immediate. I sent emails to a couple of picture editors with a couple of embedded pictures and within like half an hour, which is unknown for picture editors, they were back at me saying, oh, we love these. Can you bring them in? Can you show us more? We're really interested in publishing them. We eventually decided to publish them with text by Susan, which was an interview, basically, um, in New York Magazine, and it got so much feedback. But because we mulled over it for so long, it was a really well-done piece, and it really resonated, and I was really happy with it. And the feedback from the people that saw it, the audience, was amazing. So after the article, it first appeared in New York Magazine in print, and obviously there was an accompanying piece online that did have the photography and the text and some audio. Um, We literally sat looking at the computer, waiting for the comments to start scrolling in. There was a person who thought that Graham had faked this whole thing in order to get published and, you know, potentially get an exhibit. And that really sparked this thread about um, whether or not someone who was a heroin addict really would have the capacity to set a self-timer and take pictures of himself. And I think that gets back to this idea that we don't really understand or believe in the concept of someone who can be somewhat functional or in some cases very functional while using drugs. But there are myriad stories of people who you know, have held down careers as doctors, surgeons, lawyers, actors, professors, and then it comes out that you know, they had a serious addiction. But yet, I think sometimes because we don't see that depicted in visual imagery, we just, we can't wrap our heads around it. So in a lot of the Guardian comments, there was just the skepticism. Was he really a heroin addict? Was he really using? From there, it got picked up by Al Jazeera, the Huffington Post, and that led me to the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, where the curator there approached me and says, listen, I've never seen anything like this before. Can you bring these to me and let let me see these pictures? These are amazing, you know? So I went across and met with her, and I took maybe, I made a whole bunch of 8 by 10 prints, maybe about 80 or 90. We looked through them. I left them with her. I came back three months later. We whittled it down to like 50. I came back three months later. We whittled it down to like 25 images that were really powerful and succinct and we submitted them as a board of the Scottish National Portrait Gallery to see if we could get an acquisition. To my surprise I got and it woke up one morning, checked my emails, and there was an email from Annie Lydon, who's the curator, saying, You'll never believe it, they decided to acquire all twenty five images for the National Collection. Which was mind boggling to me to think back to taking these pictures in these dark places and these isolated, painful times that, you know, the whole all through the boards and committees of the National Portrait Gallery, which is a very traditional body of people, found this body of work so compelling and powerful that they would acquire it for their national collection, which was a real, it was really great for me. It was really a catalyst to these conversations that I think people were really anxious and and interested in having. So the series of images became sort of a gateway to these conversations about not just addiction, but how do you get clean? You know, what is that like? What is that process? What did you do? What helped you? Not that Graham's route to recovery is, you know, something that is going to work for everybody, but I think the more we talk about it, the more we can kind of learn about what works in different circumstances. One of the reasons that we're, we mostly see images of addiction and addiction sort of at the far end of the spectrum is just the shame and the stigma that surrounds you know, substance use disorder. The imagery is always about the person who's really lost everything. They're really down and out. That's something that's also missing you know, from media and kind of popular representations of addiction is that recovery piece of it. Because you know, it's maybe not as interesting visually. Um, Graham keeps asking, you know, how do you depict recovery? You know, what do you show about that? You know, where with addiction, I think there is that voyeurism factor. It's something that, you know, people, you know, largely haven't seen, although I would argue that maybe at this point, we have seen a lot of images of needles going into veins or people passed out or, 
you know, crack pipes or drugs kind of close up. And I think where we're at now is kind of trying to wrap our heads around what is that project or story that you can tell about how people get clean and sober. Some people recover without doing, you know, a rehab um, or without going to AA. Other people really rely on those peer supports. So I think, you know, finding a way to capture those stories and capture that process is something that we're both really interested in right now. I think it's the most important thing I've I've really done is put this body of work out there and engage with people. And, you know, as someone who's been the addict and the recovered person and revealing that part of my life and trying to take away some of that shame and trying to take away some of that negativity that surrounds addiction and giving people that option that, you know what, you can go that dark and that deep and end up the places I've been and still pull yourself out of that and find recovery and build, rebuild your life again. And it's not easy. There was times where it was really, really, really tough. But you know what? Being clean is eight million times better than being a heroin addict, that's for sure, you know? So, you know, I mean, it's been a crazy journey and a long journey and a tough journey for some of the friends that have seen me go through that, yourself included. But at least I came away from it with something that can help change other people's minds and bring light to what people can go through. And that's been really, really important for me. Yeah. <laughs> Is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got me. <laughs> all right, sorry. <laughs> Is, there... Is there anything else you want to say? No, I think that's about it. So now that you've heard my story and Graham's story and listened to, you know, these interviews, I kind of challenge you to think about what we've talked about and how much of the focus has been on addiction and the process of, you know, going from being a successful photographer to someone who was had lost everything and ended up in a prison cell versus the time spent on you know, talking about and addressing Graham's recovery and the treatment he got and, you know, how that worked. Because I think we all have to step back and, and see how we're representing this issue and sort of challenge ourselves to think about it in different ways and also challenge some of the stereotypes we have about what does addiction look like? You know, is it just the photographs that we see of people like Graham who are slumped over with a needle in their arm? And when we talk about it, why are we drawn to that imagery more than to images of people sitting in circles or interviews of people talking about, you know, what they had to overcome, um, the peer support they got, you know, and some that is in some senses harder to photograph. It's harder to get access, but that's part of the process that we need to be seeing and talking about and thinking about because that's really key to figuring out what works to help people who are struggling with addiction. Thank <laughs> you.